Hey folks, hope everybody's doing well and welcome back to the channel. So uh, today we're going to talk about a band that, uh, speaking for myself, were completely off of my radar and I got to thank Pete Pardo and uh, this is one, you know, a great thing about his channel is he mentions a lot of bands and sometimes they're bands you never heard of and you should check out and uh, that got me thinking and I started going back and listening to this band uh, Budgie and uh, I just been over the moon, uh, you know, listening to the records, uh, making my notes. Um, and there's a lot of notes <laughs> because uh, they're relatively new to me. So just disclaimer right now, if I get a year wrong or a song title wrong, I apologize. This band is new to me. I've only been listening to them for, I think, the last three or four months or so, just uh, going through their catalog and listening to everything multiple times and just making sure I got my list down pat. But to, to help me in this endeavor, is uh my good buddies mr martin popoff and mr p pardo how are you guys doing doing great looking That's forward to this hey man everything's cool everything's cool man like i was saying uh off air pete man you got me into this band thank you for that um i'm always checking out bands that you're mentioning because there's a lot of bands i got past my radar and uh this was a really good find like really good. I uh, going through the cat. Like I've, I've been listening to these guys for the last three, three or four months, and man, there is so much good stuff here. So much good content, and uh, you know, these guys are everything that I like in terms of because there's so much depth to what they. The reservoir is very deep. There's so much depth in what they do. You know, I mean, song to song, incredible songwriters, arrangers, just you know, experimentation, just, you know, you can't really even put a label on these guys, you know? I mean, they're a rock band, yes, but they're that and so much more, you know? You know, you know they remind me of in a lot of ways, and this, I, I know they're in, in that sort of variety thing and pulling things out and adding all kinds of different and ch all those change-ups, they remind me a lot of Clutch because Clutch does the same thing, right? You're listening to that. You think, okay, I know how this song goes. And then there's a left turn, you know, a right turn. And then, you know, left and right, getting those backwards. But, you know, but anyways, but you know what I'm getting at? Like, there's just so many different ingredients that they're pouring in. And their songs just take you on this trip, you know. And I love that, man. I love It keeps it fresh. You never get that ear fatigue thing. You know, there's always those, those surprises and those change-ups, you know, you know. And, you know, it's funny because, and Martin and I have talked about this before, I think one of the aspects I think that maybe hindered their popularity is because of their diversity, right? Because I think mm. if most of their albums have like, you know, let's say there's seven songs on there, four are bangers and the other three are these kind of like bluesy, folky, kind of weird songs that yeah. don't really fit. And I think, and you have to wonder if they were to put out albums that were like just completely pulverizing start to finish, uh, maybe they would have made it a little bigger. I don't know. You know, you, you got um, Burke's vocals, I think will also kind of either love it or you don't. Um, yeah. They're a really unique band. It's got a lot going for them. And unfortunately they never quite hit the peak of some of their contemporaries, I think, which is kind of sad because I, you know, you, you, one of the things you didn't mention in your all, all your great adjectives to talk about them and introduce them, it's like, you know, you had this, the second greatest riff master also named Tony in this band. Oh, uh, I'm going to mention him. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? And you, I'm, before I started listening to them, I remember, you remember you mentioning something about the vocal. And, dude, I did not have an issue with his voice at all. Oh, I don't either. But I've, I've told you great. To do. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's yeah yeah so usually we go around and and ask what your first i just well that's my first exposure to budgie was listening to pete talk about them and then going and listen to them listening to them but martin what was your first exposure to this band i definitely remember 
like uh, like it was yesterday. Bandolier 1975 is a new release in Magic Mushrooms. I remember just going through the racks, you know, looking for stuff to buy on one of our record trips to Spokane and seeing that cover and being absolutely blown away mm -hmm. and then turning it over and uh, being very concerned that uh, this was going to be a wasted $5.99 or $4.99. I, I think it was $5.99 um, because it didn't really look particularly heavy on the back and the song titles are just bizarre. Um, <laughs> yes. But, uh, but getting it, uh, getting it home and realizing that it was a pretty darn heavy, beautifully recorded album uh, for the, um, for the year. And I, I definitely know it was a new release because I remember getting the one after it as a new release and I remember going on a family vacation and going back and getting the earlier ones. So I would say by 76, actually 76, 77, when was that trip? Uh, so I bought two of them in Toronto, oddly enough, even though we were from BC out of Kelly. So I, I definitely got Budgie and Squawk in Toronto. So it's, it's whatever that trip was, 76, 77, by about 77, I had caught up with, with all of them. Cool. What about yourself, Pete? So this is interesting. So fast forward from when Martin got his first exposure, fast forward 30 years till I bought my first Buddy album. All right. And that was this one. And you want to know why I bought this one? Martin, why do you think I bought this back in 19? Uh, Bread fan, Metallica cover? No. No? Okay. Oh, Roger Dean? Bingo. There we I go. bought it because it had a Roger Dean cover. And, you know, I'm an enormous <laughs> Yes fan. I love Roger Dean. And I was listening to a lot of prog in the 90s. And, you know, I was like, well, I, I know I knew Brent fan, right? Because I knew Metallica covered it. But I never, ever listened to a Budgie album until I bought this reissue. And I was hooked. And I was like, holy cow, these guys are so heavy. The songs are really cool of the artwork. And then I went out and bought, you know, over a short span of time, the whole catalog. So that that was my first exposure. So, you know, Hack, just think. At, at our age now, you first getting into them a couple of months ago, think of me in, you know, the late 90s being like yeah. a 30-year-old guy who's been listening to heavy stuff for so long to finally discover a band like this pretty late when you think of it. And I was, yeah. I was to the moon. I was like, holy cow. Where's yeah, exactly. <laughs> My reaction, exactly. It's like, wow, how did I miss this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I always knew the name, you know, I know Metallica dug them. I like the covers. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, but I just yeah knew their albums. Yeah, Metallica really put them on the map, I think, uh, yeah. you know, for for large population. Let me just say quickly hello to a few people that have joined us. Sandra Picorni is with us. Steve Auger, welcome. Quentin James, Gary H., nice to see you. Uh, NRHN, okay. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's all consonants, but welcome. Uh, Gary Joyce, Jason, mm -hmm. Papa Blue, nice to see you. All right, I just want to make sure to catch everybody. Jason uh, Budney76, welcome. Captain Beyond is with us. Welcome, Captain yeah, Beyond. Man. Nice to see you. John the Dark Wizard, welcome. Okay, Pete Brown is with us. All right, I think I caught everybody. There's Brian S. Nice to see you. All righty. So uh, we decided off air we were going to do three, three, and three, right? So, um, Let's go, Martin, because you're next to me, and then we'll go down to Pete and then myself. Okay, so, so yeah, three, 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 and then I guess two at the end because we got 11, right? So my number right. 11, I'm going to start with the, the last one they ever made, 2006. Uh, you know, this reminds me a little bit of, ah, it's a weird time to get a Budgie album. It reminds me of kind of the later Nazareth <laughs> albums where you're feeling like the budgets are maybe not that great. You can still tell they're quirky songwriters. You know, the other band this reminds me of is Diamond Head with the, with the kind of quirky and interesting, a non-obvious heavy metal songwriting. And I think you get that from this. Burke always had like, a, like an ambivalence with the term heavy metal, hence the name Budgie, which is kind of jokey. You know, it's yeah, the opposite. It's yeah. not heavy. Uh, and that sort of thing in the bird on all the <coughs> stuff. So Burke was kind of an eccentric guy who was, um, you know, and sadly we lost him COPD, I believe. Right. Just like Dan, uh, more or less uh, similar so, sort of yeah. thing. Um, so, yeah, that's my number 11. Um, so, you, you know, it's just you're, you're not going to feel any of the nostalgia. Uh, at this point, it's it's no. just it's just it's not going to have the magic that any of the other ones have if you've been a long time fan. So that's my 11. My number 10, you know, they, these might be a little bit uh, contentious being this low, but um, I'll, I'll explain. So number 10, I'm going to go with Squawk. 
which is the second album from 1972. I mean, you got to give it props for being this heavy uh, back in 72. It is heavy, but it is very gluey and coagulated and stodgy sounding, you know, Whiskey River, Rockin' Man. It's kind of dated as well. Drugstore Woman. When I look at the songs, I'm just not crazy, crazy uh, about them. Um, that is uh, one of Roger Dean's earliest uh, artworks. It's an early Roger Dean. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's a little bit in that sort of uh, theme that Pete and I have talked about lots of times where um, I'm finding a lot of the pre-75 heavy stuff going down slightly in my estimation because I just kind of get depressed by it. And that's kind of like that a little bit for me. Uh, then I'm going to go July 30th, 1971. Uh, the first, uh, the first budgie album, you know, there's there, there's even, even when I did pictures of my rush books all lined out, I, I put this as a joke because budgie is like, like a baby weird rush, right? They're, they're like Max Webster's a baby rush. Budgie's a bit of a, you know, the, the, the Welsh, the Cardiff rush, uh, you know, and there, and there, they are kind of looking like rush, right? Anyways, they're power trio and all that. So this is actually a little better than squawk. The second one. And, and it's, it is a very heavy album for 1971, but again, very kind of, um, thick, stodgy, almost doomy, doomy mixed with blues. Uh, yeah. Guts, uh, rape of the locks, homicidal, suicidal sound garden covered that. Uh, but yeah, this is my, you know, my, my, I think this is a German copy. This is the one I bought, you know, my new, my new release on that trip. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the very latest. And then the very first two are my 11, 10 and I. Interesting. All righty. All right, Pete, what do you got? I already knew those were coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to uh, equal Martin for my number 11. You're all living in cuckoo land from 2006. Yeah. Um, it's not very good. I mean, it just sounds like latter period workman like budgie. I also, it's very generic. I also don't think that they tried to do some like modern production values with this and, and, things and they did some stuff to his vocals and it just doesn't doesn't work with this band you know i, I think this band for me they kind of had their time and everything within that timeline from like you know 1970 71 through like early 80s you know they they sound from that era and you put them into like 2006 and this just doesn't you know it was so many years in between albums and it just it just it's not really good. There's a couple of good songs on here. Falling is pretty good. I kind of like uh, Justice is all right. Dead Men Don't Talk rocks pretty hard. The rest of it, it's kind of forgettable. Um, you know, cool to see them do another record, but it's, it's just not very good, unfortunately. So that's my number 11. Uh, everything else I like pretty much. That To me, that's really their only really weak album. I'm going to go number 10. I'm going to go 1982's Deliver Us From Evil. And I know Martin's a bigger fan of this album than I am, but I do like this album. I think the sound is really changing here for them. Uh, you got a keyboard player now, Duncan McKay, who's a great player, does a lot of really cool stuff on here. Unfortunately, though, it makes it, it, it takes away from like the guitar thunder on this album, I think. Yep. They're a lot more keyboard oriented. And to me, this sounds like, like an early 80s Uriah Heap album or a Gamma album. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, uh, I don't know if I want Budgie to sound like that. So some good songs on here. It's a little light. Don't Cry is great. Bored with Rush is really good. Finger on the Button rocks hard. I think there's some good material on here. I just wish it had a little bit more balls. I'm just missing missing the guitars a little bit. You know, John Thomas is a good player, but I, I want to hear more of him. But good album. I think if you like that early 80s kind of British commercial hard rock sound, it's pretty good. And then uh, number nine, I'm going to go to 1981. Sorry, uh, Night Flight. Great album cover. This is their second, arguably their second new wave of British heavy metal record, but it's a little lighter, a little more melodic than Power Supply that came before it. Songs aren't quite as good. It's not nearly as heavy, but it's still a good, accessible early 80s hard rock record. It's got nice, big, bright production. And I absolutely love I Turned to Stone, which is a great, great track. Unfortunately, it's the best song on the album, but uh, still pretty good. Solid record. I know the, it's got its fans. And like I said, great album cover. So there we have it. Uh, you're all living in cuckoo land, delivers from evil, and night flight. I, I noticed one thing. I noticed a, a, a big difference in Burt Shelley's voice from the 70s stuff to like the 80s and later stuff. It's almost like his voice got a little lower. You guys find that? Or is that just me? 
I don't know. It just, it's got a little different tonality to it. Maybe it's just cause he's a little older. I, I don't know, but I, I there, there is a difference there. Um, all right. Well, I'm kind of uh, sort of along the same lines as Pete. Uh, my number 11 is uh, deliver us from evil 1982. Um, you know, this has all the trappings of an 80s rock album with the keyboards. It's got the chorus C guitars. Like, it's very much a, a record of the time. Uh, it's a real poppy album, and the po- and it's a little too poppy for me at times. You know, that whole formulaic 80s thing, not a big fan of that. That being said, there's some rock and gems in here. I love Truth, uh, Truth Drug, Young Girls, a well-written pop song. Um, at times the album can sound formulaic, like flowers in the attic is so generic that could fit on any buddy's eighties rock record. Like it's just, you know, it sounds like everybody else. Um, although the instrumental section on that is, is pretty cool. Hold on to love is okay. Uh, it's a decent album, but it sounds like I've heard these songs before in other albums. So that's sort of the, you know, they were trying to do the eighties thing and they were doing the eighties thing, but you know, they were losing their individuality. I thought on that one a little bit. Uh, my number 10 is night flight. So see, I flipped my order. So I got to flip my sheets here. Um, so night flight, 1981, pretty good album. Uh, it's poppy still, but with, with some heavier guitars, it's got a lot of great hooks on it. Um, I love the guitar playing of, uh, big John Thomas. I think, uh, I mean, he's not a Tony Borge. He's a completely different player, uh, but I, I do appreciate his playing. I think it's quite good. Uh, Keeping a Rendezvous is cool. Shoes Me Up is a great rocker. It's not a bad record. I would have preferred more heavy stuff there than the couple of metal tunes on there. The metal tunes don't do it for me on that record, but it's not, not terrible, not terrible. And uh, my number nine is Cuckoo Land. So, Cuckoo Land. We're all living in Cuckoo Land. 2006, last record. Uh, starts off great with that great riff, uh, Fest on Justice. That's a really cool track. Uh, Dead Men Don't Talk, I think is a great track. It's got a real nice uh, kind of an Aerosmith feel to it, and the solo on that is epic. Um, some other cool tracks on this. I like f- uh, Falling. It's funky and kind of cool. Tell Me, Tell Me is incredible i really like that song it's i got a cheap trick vibe to it um i don't want to throw you is great as well i think it's a pretty good album uh, it's heavy at times and it has some great hooks so of the latter periods of those three that's my number 11 10 9 so that's my number nine so there you go all right so my 11 was uh deliver us from evil night flight and then you're you're the we're you're all living in cuckoo land all righty so next three what do you got for eight seven and six okay so my number eight is never turn your back on a friend evidently i don't own a copy of it anymore so um but uh i would say bread fan is very close to their greatest song ever there you go <coughs> i don't want to hear baby please don't go i i don't like the fact that there's seven songs on here and two of them are short, mellow ones. And uh, you're the biggest thing since Powdered Milk. You know, that's a typical old budgie title. And I don't think it's that great a song. And Grip of a Tire Fitter's Hand is pretty good. Um, you know, I, I think the Dark Horse winner on here, besides Bread Fan, is almost Parents and Riding My Nightmare. So, yeah, it's a little patchy. Um, and I think that's kind of a theme with these budgie albums, right? It's, it's like we love certain songs on them a lot. But when you add up the whole albums, you know, there's, there's usually a lot to complain about, right? Um, my number seven is uh, in for the kill. So this is the uh, only one with Pete Boot drumming on it, right? Uh, May seventeenth, seventy four, recorded at Rockfield. Like most of what they do is recorded at Rockfield, uh, but this one is self produced. Um, it's got the crazy, crazy heaviness of "In for the Kill." Again, one of the greatest budgie songs. Crash Course and Brain Surgery. Again, covered Metallica, right? Yeah, uh, maybe yeah. Right, so please. that's really cool. Um, it's 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 a little bit compromised by the shaker. Uh, a percussion in it that that takes a little and it's got a weird guitar tone like it's in for the kill is just like you know 
absolutely wall to wall heavy. It was really cool. Zoom clubs, cool too. Hammer and tongs. I mean, there's some really good stuff on here. Yeah. Even the stuff that's uh that's a little mellower. I mean, I I honestly I, I guess I could have put this a little higher, but 74, yeah, really good one. And you know, back to the uh back to the old old rush thing. Does that not look like Getty or, or what? Oh, <laughs> so good. So good. Give, you, give him a Rickenbacker, Martin, and there you go. Yeah, right? face, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So that's my number seven. My number six, I'm going to go with one that I was horrified with after hearing Bandolier. When I got this, I was really not happy with it, but I, I, I love it more and more over the years. I think this is their more their their most finicky and complicated sort of album. I think and again is really cool and a weird heavy one. If I were Britannia, I'd wave the rules, got that super heavy part, and then it goes into that jazz fusion, Ian Gillen band, Pace Ashton Lord kind of music, right? Um Quackers and bureaucrats is just kind of funky, cool. Your opening door is a good mellow one in here. But but side two, sky high percent percentage is one of their great rockers and then black velvet stallion is is one of their it's their ufo love to love right it's their sort of a masterpiece of being a proggy long really cool one with that really dramatic ending so so yeah i i really like the fact that this is um i appreciate that it's probably their most experimental and uh and even though it's got a variety of stuff on it it all kind of hangs together because it's it's all really all weird together uh whereas a lot of budgie stuff it's like one kind of song, but that's not that weird. And another kind of song, but it's not that weird. When you put it all together, it makes a weird album. This is like every song has is, is got strange stuff about it. Strange, sophisticated, very non-obvious, very non-commercial. Yeah. Um, they weren't going to get anything with this, and, and they didn't. I mean, even the title, If I Were Britannia, I'd Wave the Rules. Right? Yeah. It's just like, what, what the heck like are you doing? You got to deduct a couple points for that terrible logo, right? Oof. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to mention before I forget is, is, uh, this is another situation where I never had any problem with Burke's voice either. Uh, all those years, I never thought, oh boy, I don't like his voice. No. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny. We talk about Kim Mitchell that way all the time. I, I never had a problem with Kim Mitchell's voice. I play mm -hmm. it for people and they go, oh, that's amazing. I'm not crazy about that guy's voice. Right. So, yeah. so it is funny. I, I, but I have heard that before about Burke, but I, it's never been with me. So there you go. Uh, never turn your back on friend eight in for the kill seven fire Britannia six. All right. Okay. What do you got Pete for eight, seven and six? All right. Number eight on the go. 1978's impeccable. Good album. A little different. Uh, I remember the first time I heard this, I was like, all right, this album kind of reminds me of trapeze in spots. I think his, his, again, you, you hack, you mentioned early on, like his voice sounds different on some of these albums. And I yeah. hear a little bit of Glenn Hughes from him on this album. And I think the music, uh, the songs are a little bit more musical. There's a little funkiness going on. In some spots. Yes. Some mm -hmm. strong songs, though. Um, you know, Melt the Ice Away is great. I love Pyramid. Dish It Up is really good. I mean, really, there's no bad songs on here. Uh, maybe I'm missing a little bit of the that kind of uh, wall-crushing riff sound from the early albums. But I think for the latter part of the decade... Uh, I think it's a pretty strong record. And again, I, I can appreciate them trying to do some different things here. So uh, that's my number eight. And number seven, I'm also going to go with uh, If I Were Britannia, I'd Wave the Rules from 76. I don't like the production of this album at all. You ever notice that at all, Martin? The production's really Yeah, weird. it's pretty thin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this would have been, if this had the production of Bandolier, I think this would rank higher for me. Yeah. Um, it sounds really flat, but there's some, as Martin mentioned, there's some really strong songs on here. Uh, Anna Nagin is great. Love the title track. This got some. They got some really cool little complex bits going in there. It gets heavy in spots. Sky high percentage kills. And I really, really love Black Velvet Stallion. There's some great guitar work going on there. Yep. Really nice <laughs> atmospheric yep. slow build. Just really, really good stuff. Great, yeah. great. Actually, you think of that get that guitar solo, and, and it reminds you of La Villa Strangiato, right? It's got a little bit vibe yeah. to it, right? So yeah, yep. there's there's a lot of parallels with these guys with the rock. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it's a really good track. And then number six, I'm gonna go with Power Supply from 1980. Mm -hmm. Solid, solid slice of new wave of British heavy metal. Take budget. Yep. Realized they're like, oh, we, we can we can play along with this as well, right? And do it mm -hmm. really, really well. I mean, forearm smash just kills. Hell, yep. 
heavy revolution. I mean, the first three songs, just boom, 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 boom. Gunslinger is great. Title track is great. Crime Against the World is a great anthem. Uh, I, I think this whole album is pretty memorable. It's very metal. And uh, it's just a shame that the next album didn't quite bring the same kind of thunder. But I think, uh, you know, these guys basically were like, you know, we're not going to let all the young bucks get all the credit for doing this heavy metal thing, even though, you know, Burke always said he wasn't really into the whole idea of them being metal. But yeah, this really solid, record, really good. That's my number six. Cool. Nice. All right. So my number eight, and you guys mentioned this one already. If I were Britannia, I'd weigh the rules 1976. Um, you know, this is a, I say original lineup, but I, I know they've gone through multiple drummers, but Tony Borg is on this is uh, the, the important thing. Um, I love how much these guys experiment and mix things up on their 70s records. Um, and this album is full of examples. I, I was talking about earlier about just change ups left and right. Uh, the title cut, I mean, it has a great off-time proggy opening riff, then it moves through rock, and then it gets into some fun. Like, I just love that, you know, they take you on that trip, right? Your, op your opening door is just fantastic. Great chord progressions. These guys were very sophisticated in some of their arrangements. Just really well done. Sky High Percentage that you uh, mentioned, just a great up-tempo rocker. And Black Velvet Stallion, man, that takes the cake. I mean, it's cool as hell, you know. I I really dig this album. It would be higher on my list, except everything up from here up is is just that much better. But this is not a bad album at all. It is a pretty damn good record. So that's my number eight. My number seven also mentioned Power Supply. Man, this is like the perfect '80s rock record. It's 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 killer top to bottom i mean the opener you mentioned forearm smash hellbender right after you got two great lead off tracks right off the bat i mean it's pretty it's a pretty heavy 80s record it's got some great tracks and some killer riffs i like every track on this record yes even the slow one time to remember i think is good uh this for me like i said is a perfect 80s record you got the catchy riffs you got the good songs you got plenty of hooks top to bottom this is a killer record killer it should have been huge right especially in that time frame that it came out 1980 and uh my number six is impeccable what a shitty album cover that is man if that doesn't turn people away i don't know what it will it just what the hell were they thinking man yeah. anyways shitty album but a pretty good record riffs aren't quite as heavy on this one uh but there's a lot of groove i find on this record some funk on there some funk leanings uh which i really dig um and it's got a lot of extended solos and i could listen to tony borge play like forever i mean the guy's just a killer player i absolutely love love for you and me great riff and the b section is amazing uh, again, they take you on a musical journey, and I love that. Uh, All at Sea, very Hendrix-like, um, great track. Smile Boy Smile, cool rocker. Uh, cool, what did I say about that? I lost my spot. Uh, Smile Boy Smile, cool rocker. Uh, gets a little bit of the jazz, and I love, the, I love that they're incorporating like different styles into their music. I mean, this album has all the elements I love about Budgie. It goes through multiple styles seamlessly and takes you musically to a lot of different areas. And there's zero ear fatigue with these guys. I mean, even within a song, they'll go through multiple styles. And uh, yeah, very, very cool. So my eight, seven, and six. So my number eight was uh, If I Were Britannia, then Power Supply, and then Impeccable. So there you go. So we're down to six. So shall we do two at a time now? Uh, so we got. Uh, so we go two, two, and then two, and then one. Okay. Sure. All right. Yeah. Okay. So my number five is uh, Night Flight. I didn't have any copies of uh, um, you know, uh, Never Turn You Back on a Friend, but I got four copies of this. <laughs> 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 so we got uh, two, uh, one vinyl, and uh. 
you know, these, there was, there was a time there uh, when you could actually get these uh, all, all completely signed by the band at the website, right? I've done some training and I got this signed by Derek Riggs because, um, you know, earlier we had early Roger Dean, but this is a very early Derek Riggs. So this yep. is one of the first things he ever did. Right. Um, so yeah, I love this album. Um, this is a little bit like the Tigers of Pantang, the cage situation where they used to be a heavy band, uh, but then they made a poppy album and surprised me. And then I was into it. Right. Um, and so this, this does not, this is not nearly as heavy as it looks. Um, but um, I like kind of the, the raw production of it, but I like the idea that they, they were brave to do these kind of mellower tunes i love i turned to stone it's just so kind of regal and doomy uh keeping a rendezvous is a good poppy one reaper the glory is a little heavier she used me up a little heavier don't lay down and die quite quite melodic um apparatus you know mellow one in there um yeah so so i i was just kind of pleasantly surprised that after power supply which i've got higher um they went kind of poppy, um, but kept kind of a gritty new wave of British heavy metal production. Uh, this this also is recorded at Rockfield. Um, so that's my number five. My number four, I almost could have put higher. This one I only have uh, three copies of. So uh, we've got Deliver Us From Evil, um, which I love to death. This is probably the budgie album I've played the most. Uh, it was just a weird time that it just fell into my life at this time and just played this album over and over again. This is uh, even poppier and more keyboardy than Night Flight. Um, and uh, just love it to death. Love this kind of poppy. Bored with Rush is one of my favorite, you know, budgie songs ever. Um, and yet it's it's just a weird pop one from a pretty, pretty maligned album. People are not not that crazy. Uh, and and the, the heavier stuff on here, I, I love Hold On to Love. It's got a good gallop to it. Finger on the Button is like heavy and then it's got like a like a mellow like a nice melodic verse the production's a little better than the previous one um so yeah i've only got it here at number four but uh you know it's it's almost my sentimental favorite it, it, it's almost my number one uh in in a sense uh because it is the one i'll probably still going forward play more than any i love norad yeah give me the truth just ev everything on here just uh just kind of kind of hits those nice melodic sort of chords uh, for me. So number five, Night Flight, four, Deliver Us From Evil. Okay. So what's your five and four, Pete? Uh, so my, the top five was hard because for me, yeah. the top five are, you know, pretty damn good for me. Um, mm -hmm. I ultimately decided to go with Bandolier, 1975, number five. For, this has the best production of any Budgie album. This yeah. is a big, bold great sounding album and i wish they captured this a, a more often in their catalog it just sounds great the, the the guitars sound great the vocals everything about it just really really it just speaks to you from the first listen uh breaking all the house rules crushes who do you want for your love very musical then it gets riffy towards the end uh i can see my feelings big hard rocker uh, i ain't no mountain another big crushing number love that and then you know mm -hmm. you got the great Napoleon Bonaparte one and part two, which two, yeah. two where there are, you know, I always kind of count them as one, but uh, mm. that's, you know, top 10 budgie song for me or songs. I think it's an excellent record. Love the, uh, the cover. That's why I bought the shirt. Right. But, uh, and it could rank higher, but that just goes to show you how much I love the next four. But uh, yeah, this is, I, I, if, if someone wanted to dive into budgie for the first time and go this route, I wouldn't argue that at all. I totally agree with that. Totally. That's a great way to start. Yeah. It's just, it's just the best sounding uh, budgie record. And it's yeah. pretty consistent with very the consistent. The cross. Yeah. Yeah. My number four, I'm going to go to 1972 squawk. Again, I have uh, a lot of love for the early albums because those are the ones I bought first. And I like the real, real, real riffy budgie. That's just me. Right. But um, squawk is great. Roger Dean cover again. You know, I like whiskey river. Rockin' Man's kind of silly, but I kind of dig that. But man, this has got Hot as a Docker's Armpit, which I love. Uh, <laughs> Young as a World is tremendous. It's like this weird kind of zeppelin -y, bluesy, folky, slow build, and then the riffs come in, and it's just like yeah. gargantuan doom riffs. I just love it. Stranded is great. Uh, drugstore Women, it's kind of like their boogie. I don't know. It, for me, there's nine tracks on here. 
but like half of them I love so much that even if some of the other ones aren't as quite as great, the, the songs I really like on here just elevated for me. And let me tell you, for those who are watching the show have never listened to Budgie, go check out Young as a World and let it blow your mind. It's just, it's eight minutes long. It's really, really cool. And some of the heaviest riffs you'll hear from the early 70s. And it takes you on a nice musical trip, right? It does, right? Because it's kind of jazzy for a bit. And oh, all yeah. And this big doomy shit comes in, and it's just like, I, where did that come from? I right? love, I love the, when they go through different styles, and they ah. just, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's killer. Yeah. Uh, well, this is guy, this guys already talked about this one, but uh, my number five is Squawk, 1972. Uh it's got a couple of really beautiful acoustic songs on this. I'm not fond of all their acoustic stuff. Some of it's kind of, you know, weak. But this on this one, I think Rolling Home Again and especially Make Me Happy, is. A, I think that's a fantastic song. I love Hot as a Dog. I can't even say without laughing. Well, some of the songs are ridiculous, and they're so long. Oh, yeah. Hot as a Docker's Armpit. Great title and even better song. The riff is awesome. That extended solo is great. Tony is such a, I wrote down here, just a great, because who talks about this guy? He's underrated. Nobody knows this guy, right? Just a great underrated player. Uh, absolutely dig Young as a World. It is epic. Absolutely epic. Nice metal, jazzy feel, and it's interspersed with some killer heavy riffs that just come in. And it's got that frantic, crazy guitar solo on there. Amazing. Stranded, also very cool. The jam change up is great. You, I mean, there's there's songs that these guys do, and one of the reasons why they're eight or nine minutes long, it's like they play the song and then they jam for like three minutes, and then they come back to the the original theme, right? And that's yeah. what makes that's why these songs are so long. But those jams are intense, man. These guys are such good players, man, and tighter than a bug's ass. Like just really, really good. Um, uh, number four, uh, in for the kill. Uh, 1974. This, I think, is probably their heaviest record. It's super heavy for 1974. Uh, starts off strong with that title cut. It's just so heavy and cool. Zoom Club is, again, I keep saying epic, but you know, it's a plotting potpourri of awesome riffs. That's what that song is. It's killer. It's the star of the album for me. Um, and that extended jam that I was just talking about earlier, and that, re and that song is fantastic. Hammer and Tongs, great song, very dirgy, heavy track. Living on Your Own is a great closer. I love all those parts, uh, their arrangements, and it's so well done where they go again from part to part, different styles seamlessly, and everything just flows. And that's why these guys remind me of Clutch, because Clutch does that a lot too. So, uh, yeah, that's my number five and four. Number five, Squawk, and uh, number four, In for the Kill. Okay. So, three and two. What do you got, Martin? Okay. So, for uh, number three, I've got Power Supply. Um, so, I think they really did this new wave of British heavy metal idea really good. So, this is when they're uh, they're off of their, uh, I guess, MCA and A&M uh, over here onto RCA Active, uh, this little label. This is my UK copy, so that's what the, that's what the label looked like on it. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of a goofy album cover, but you knew it was going to be pretty new wave of British heavy metal with Power Supply. I mean, Hellbender, Heavy Revolution, and Secrets in My Head are just just smoking, super heavy, uh, really really good ones. And then and then some of the other heavy stuff is kind of ACDC ish a little bit, right? Which is fine as well. And Crime Against the World, you know, like you guys said, Anthem, Time to Remember is a good mellow one on here. I just think yeah, uh, eight tracks. Um, I, I think they just really knocked it out of the park. I remember, you know, in the thick of the new wave of British heavy metal, getting this and thinking this totally competes with any of the young bands. Uh, yeah. We just thought it was really good and raw and no nonsense. And it was a really shocking welcome change. Um, and I always cite these guys as, uh, as the band out of any old timer band who made the biggest drastic change uh, to, to be part of this whole thing. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it was probably seen as a little bit opportunistic, but I think they did an amazing job with it. So that's my number three. Num my number two, I went with Bandolier, which I agree with Pete. Um, the production on this is one of the best sounding albums of the mid seventies you could possibly imagine. It's just crushing. Uh, and Napoleon Bonaparte takes full advantage of that, making it, you know, up there with, uh, 
uh, Bread Fan and a song I'll mention later uh, as my favorite Budgie songs. It's great. I Can't See My Feelings. Our band in the 80s played that live. Um, but I like Ain't No Mountain. Uh, breaking All the House Rules is just so, just gorgeous. Huge guitar tones uh, on that. Sounds really good. Uh, yeah, and this is this is one of the ones with all the uh, with with the never turn your back on a friend, which is on you know it's a previous album, but you know uh, so one uh, let's see uh, one two three of the you can't even count up how many songs are on here because because <laughs> three uh, side two has a three A and B, but anyways three of them have a slash in them, so they got two titles each. Um, and then you've got an A and B it's, it's very ridiculous, but, uh, just a good action packed, you know, and that was my first budgie album. So I'm, I'm, you know, we liked budgie at that point after that. So that's my three and two. Would you say Martin and Pete, that those two records are their most consistent? Cause we talked about earlier, like each one, each album is great, but it would have a couple of dogs in it, but those two records, would you say they were their most consistent? Maybe not your favorite songs, but the most consistent top to bottom. I, I mean, definitely think Power Supply pretty consistent. Yeah. You know, I I mean, it's like the difference in the two records is you know top Bandoliers. Bottom, yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, Power Supply and Bandolier. I would. I would say. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. It's like you know, Bandolier's got all the quirkiness and all the you know, and they substituted that for just a straight up rock record for Power Supply. But they both records are equally, I think, you know good good listens all the way through there's not a dud on anyone either of those records for me anyways yeah okay what do you got pete for f three and two number three i'm gonna go with the debut budgie 1971 powerhouse so heavy for the time i mean jesus guts yeah <laughs> is there a heavier opener from 1971 than guts i mean yeah, holy killer. moly it's killer sick. Jesus, that, that's what, you know, you said it before, Hack, how Tony Borge doesn't get mentioned in the kind of like the pantheon of the greatest riff masters of all time. I'll never understand, you know, when I did when I did my favorite riff master show uh, last month or whatever, he, he was day two, man. I was like, oh, I got to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that. So yeah. good. Um, you know, new disintegrating parachutist woman. Another ridiculously long, crazy title. Great, great song. I love Rape of the Locks. So heavy. Homicidal, suicidal. Uh, you know, again, you got some kind of silly stuff on here, too. But the, like I said, the songs that are great on here are just so bulldozing and so heavy for the time. Uh, I really like it. You know, I think they they would kind of move away from this kind of little bluesiness that they did on the first few albums. But uh, I still really dig it a lot. So that's my number three. And my number two, I'm going to go with uh, Never Turn Your Back on a Friend. 1973 you know again it's got bread fan it's got you're the biggest thing since powdered milk great songs and the grip <laughs> of the tire fitter's hand is great and then it's got parents oh parents. another one of those big yeah. long epic songs that just takes you on this weird ass journey like you think they're going to give you like this little extended jazz break and then these sledgehammer riffs come in yeah ah oh, just crazy stuff crazy stuff yeah i mean and, and I love, I, I like the way this album sounds. I like the production. And it's got a great Roger Dean painting on the outside, which I give it props for that as well. And again, it's the first budgie album I ever bought. So I'll always have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, loyalty to this album. But it's not quite my favorite, but that's my number two. Well, I swear we didn't rehearse this ahead of time. <laughs> but uh, my number three is... The debut uh, and guts. Uh, what an absolutely fantastic opener! It's got so much groove and heaviness. The riff is just this destructive. Uh, the author, epic. Uh, you know, you got some light and dark. This one, what I noticed about this one is what we haven't talked about. We've talked a lot about Tony Borge, but how about uh, Burke Shelley on the bass? Oh, yeah. His bass playing on this song. And this album, I think, really, really stands out. It really shows here. He's playing some really nice lines. And, uh, I mean, it's so cool when that song picks up in the middle and then it takes you on another musical journey. I mean, that, that song's amazing. Rape of the Locks, love the playing on this. The band is just so good. They're so just listening to them play as a, as a three-piece is amazing. Homicidal, suicidal is crushing. 
and it's got that great breakdown in the middle that is just so freaking cool. I mean, I love their B sections. Sometimes their B sections are better than their A sections, right? When they start jamming or like twist the riff around or whatever, just amazing. And we didn't, and, it, but produced by Roger Bain, who produced the first Black Sabbath album as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And my number two, "Never Turn Your Back on a Friend," nineteen seventy three. I mean, it opens with Brett Fan, amazing, you know, made famous by Metallica, of course. I love that breakdown because, again, they do that breakdown, it gets all mellow. And what does that do? It cleanses your ears. And then that riff comes back and just punches you in the jaw. It's, you know, that's just, I love that device that they use there. Baby, please don't go. I know, Martin, you mentioned you're not a fan of it. I don't like the original song, but I love the way they play it. They kill it, man. They kill it. Uh, you're the biggest thing since powdered milk <laughs> proves if you don't, that song is proof that if you don't in initially like, like one of their songs, just give it a minute because these guys are going to go through so many sections that it will turn into a different song and it'll be something that you absolutely love. And that is, that is an example of that because the back half of that song is fantastic in the grip of a, of a tire fitters hand. These titles, man. Whatever. Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, that's a great rocker. And what can you say about the closer parents, man? That is beautiful jazzy. I, I mean, Tony, great rock player, blues rock player, but the jazzy stuff he's laying down on this song is fantastic. It's got some great hooks, but Tony's playing on this on that song in particular is just beautiful, man. You know, that's a guy who's got a reservoir. He can he can go deep, man, and he's got a lot of a lot of tools in his. Uh, in his uh, toolbox yeah those are my number three and number two so number three the debut and number two never turn your back on a friend there you go now we're down to the f number one okay well my number one i went with my framed up copy of it impeccable impeccable it's my vinyl and there's my cd of it so yeah this is the weird one that uh budgie came to elmer ontario to record this album is that right? is basically at, at rockfield and various places over there uh yeah and just kind of a nondescript spent a lot of money on it um to me what i like about this album steve williams drumming is amazing you know we should mention you know ray phillips is the early drummer you got pete boot in the middle you got steve williams on on the stuff moving forward um his drumming is amazing the production is great on this it's uh it's very high fidelity, but it can be a little on the thin side. Um, but what I what I think about this album is that it's the uh, it's the finicky, sophisticated, weird jazziness of uh, if I were Britannia, but heavied up a little. Um, so it's kind of a heavier version of that because you do have the likes of. Uh, so okay, so it's got here's the other song that I would say is a favorite. So you got Bread Fan, Napoleon, and Melt the Ice Away. It's it's right. almost like their deep purple burn. It's just like a whittly Richie Blackmore kind of riff. It's got this amazing drum groove to it. It's it's got this stop section, kind of the Led Zeppelin black dog thing. Um, really, really cool. A little black velvet stallion to it, maybe as well. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the author. And, uh, you know, later on, UFO's got the writer and uh, and UFO's got Paul Chapman, who is a who is a is Welsh. Right. And these guys are a Welsh band. They all knew each other. And we should also mention that Budgie was very tied in with Judas Priest all the time. They were touring with them. In yeah, Europe. true. Even before Priest had, you know, now, you know Budgie was actually kind of their mentors uh, in a way uh, at, at the early stages. So um, but uh, yeah, Smile Boy Smile with with its heavy. But it's sort of like uh, like a little galloping as well, but it's a little Celtic as well. Um, don't dilute the water again. It's it's heavy, but it's also got some funkiness to it. This album, um, so it yeah. is a little fusiony. It's a little it's mm -hmm. a like a heavier Ian Gillen band album versus a crappy Ian Gillen band album, I suppose. Um, but um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's and it fits into that time frame of these albums that I really like. I like that it's a '78 album. It just I, I like the place that it that it sits in the catalog. Like I say, super experimental and interesting, but still pretty heavy. And then the shocker after this is they just sound on power supply. They sound like a completely different band. They sound nothing like this. It's one of the biggest changes is that that you could that you could sort of imagine. But uh, yeah, pyramids dish it up. 
just weird stuff. You know, it's, it's very, like I say, it, it's weird, but it's at least got some riffs to it. So, and, and our contrarians episode a very early one, I rated it as my favorite I did a whole episode on it. Um, so I'm going to stick with that. Put it, put it number one. Yeah. Yeah. I love the jazzy stuff, jazzy stuff on that. And, and the funky stuff on that. It's almost like they're, uh, um, is it, what's that thin Lizzie record? Is it nightlife? Is that the one? Nightlife. Oh yeah. 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 That's like their nightlife to me when I listen to that. Yeah. It's, it has that other ingredient that they don't normally put in their song. So, all right. What do we got Pete? What's your number one? Martin, this isn't funny. Martin and I did a whole show a while ago on how he always gravitates towards the late '70s stuff for most bands, and I do the early. And this is a per perfect example of that again, right? It yeah, just, it just happens time and time again. Um, and my number one has been my number one for a long time, and that's 1974's "In for the Kill." Yeah, I mean, yeah. man, the opening title track—if that crushing brontosaurus gallop doesn't i mean it's literally like a big dinosaur dun, 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 just like rampaging down the, through the woods man yeah, uh, yeah. So good. and you know crash course and brain uh, surgery is amazing zoom club is amazing hammer and togs is amazing yeah. the other stuff is good too i love the big sound of this uh you, you, but mark was right there there is kind of a weird thing going on with the guitars on this album, but I don't mind. It's kind of like more chainsaw-y on this, on this particular album, but man, the songs are so heavy. Uh, and that title track just kills me every single time. So yeah, that's my yeah. number one in for the kill. Nice. Cool. Well, my number one, and you guys already mentioned this bandolier. There you go. Yeah. And it's, why is it my favorite? It's not my favorite because it has the, my favorite songs on it. It's my favorite because it, and I've talked about this earlier, it is the most consistent top to bottom record. And yeah, if you want to get in a budgie, there's a great place to start. Um, you know, I mean, breaking all the house rules, just a great up tempo rocker. The riff is killer. It's got an, another incredible B section, slip away, beautiful hypnotic song, little bit of jazz very jazzy and cool who do you want for love a nice change up to a funkier tune again it's got that variety just again another killer b section again go straight back into the rock riffing i can't see my feelings what a riff man and hooky as freaking hell like you know why this some of this stuff didn't get on the radio i don't know solo section is so cool you know got a little bit of wah happening there i ain't no mountain I ain't no man. I mean, that is such a hooky, catchy chorus, man. And the riff that, you know, and Burke is doubling it on the bass. It's it, it, the riff is killer. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte one and two. <laughs> Come on. Epic song. It, it again, beautiful chord progressions on, you know, very sophisticated chord progression. And then you get that great gallop that comes in. Right. And they finish it on a different chord every time, which is so cool. Right. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, these guys are just on another level. Um, Honey, uh, Closer, very Beatle-like, nice harmonies. You don't really hear a lot of harmonies on their stuff. And it's just a great Closer. Absolutely love this record. I love the great variety. It's got nice change-ups, keeps you engaged. Uh, and, and I just mentioned here that these guys are just fantastic songwriters and arrangers. And not to mention just absolutely fantastic players and folks go listen to budgie i mean if nothing else if you're watching this show i am a believer go listen to budgie <laughs> just fantastic so there you go yeah i think if you have a hard time finding any of these on you know physical copy like cd or, or vinyl I, I know they have a couple of pretty extensive compilations like two or three cd compilations those are probably worth checking out too a lot of the really their, their strong songs are all on there so if you wanted to go that route too one thing yeah. also we should we should dedicate this episode to chris pike um who we sadly lost from cancer chris chris did these i think it's three large and then right. a couple small but big huge books on budgie uh and and you know full color throughout did a ton of interviews um just amazing detail pages and pages and pages on every single album and uh yeah sa sadly we lost him to cancer he's a buddy of mine he he helped lay out some of you know a bunch of my ebook stuff early on and i, I sort of got him down this path and, and he did these books um nice. but yeah no longer with us and they're they're no longer available but they're they're amazing scholarly you know huge huge books on budgie yeah yeah 
All and right. Maybe you should, uh, in honor of, of of him, you should do your own budgie book at some point in time, right? Yeah, I've uh, I've been I've been I've been in talks with his uh, with his wife about uh, possibly you know working on you know re reconstituting that material in some way. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, what do you got coming up? Uh, let's go, Martin. What's uh, I, you mentioned uh, off air? You got a new book. Well, yeah, overnight I got in the new Cure book, um, Wild Mood Swings, Disintegrate, Disintegrating the Cure, album by album, which, where I assemble this panel and basically I'm the moderator of a panel and they go through it. It's, it's, like, it's like one of our shows, uh, but just in book form. And I've got another one of those coming on Blue Oyster Cult, which is a massive, you know, it's about twice as big as this one. So yeah, that, that Cult one just, or Cure one just came out um, uh, yesterday. Uh, so that's all at martinpopoff.com. Of course, I got the audio podcast, History in Five Songs with Martin Popoff, and we've got the video show, Contrarians. Link to Martin's website is below. Pete, what's coming up on Sea of Tranquility? Uh, I mean, you know, just the normal stuff. We got uh, we do like a horror movie themed show tomorrow on Thursday night. So that's coming up tomorrow. We're actually going to be talking about our favorite sword and sorcery film. So that's happening. Uh, that's the only non musical show we do on the channel. But Martin and, and I'll be back together Friday morning. We've got another cool show planned for this Friday. Uh, and then I have uh, ranking the album show. I think I'm doing Blondie on Sunday. Oh, so, nice. Uh, yeah. And then uh, next week on in the prog seat, we're doing kind of a little bit of a different show. We're doing a whole like Latin rock primer. So that basically Santana and all the bands that kind of oh, yeah. followed in that wake who played that really cool kind of, uh, you know, Spanish psychedelic rock type of uh, sound. So we're going to do a whole primer on that. So that's kind of what's coming up over the next couple of days. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for watching. If you want to help support the channel, I have links be below for guitar hack merch, like shirts and mugs and all that good stuff. There's a PayPal down there as well. That would be much appreciated. If you don't follow me on Facebook or on Instagram, those links are below and uh, go check out some original music. I've got a playlist full of original songs. I'm working on another one, probably coming out in the next month, month and a half. So go check out the original music. And, uh, you know, I'd like to do what Budgie does. I like to change things up. <laughs> so I do a lot of that. That's why you know, I hear other bands. They're like, man, I love that stuff. I love when bands just take you on a little journey, right? So, all right. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we will be doing this again next month. Uh, I will let you know what uh, what band we'll be discussing. It's going to be one of two bands. I don't know which order you guys want to do those two in, but we'll talk about that off air. Anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great rest of your week, and uh, have a great weekend. All right, take care, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>